later. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for thank you for being here with us today. I hope that uh, all uh, all of those who have been or who were yesterday at the uh, gala dinner uh, enjoyed yourselves and had a great time with the. Uh, uh, with the food and, and with the music, uh, but now we have to get back to work. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our fourth uh, plenary uh, speaker in, in the, unfortunately, last day of the conference. Um, Mario Afelar holds a PhD in American Literature from Lisbon University, 1993, with a thesis on Sylvia Plath's poetry. He's professor of English and American Studies at the Portuguese uh, Open University, where he has been teaching since 1998. He's director of the Research Center of uh, Lisbon University Cascais Crossroad of the Arts, financed by King Louis I Foundation. Early this year, he was appointed vice president of the Lisbon Geographical Society. He's researcher of Ulysses, University of Lisbon Center for English Studies, a member of the Portuguese Academy of uh, History and, uh, and the uh, Portuguese Navy Academy. He has been coordinating the Higher Education and Science Commission of the Community of Portuguese Speaking Countries since 2015. In 1985, when he was a junior assistant lecturer at Lisbon University, he received a Fulbright Fellowship at the University of Minnesota. Among other uh, former functions stands out the presidency of the Anglo-American Portuguese Studies Association from 2009 uh, to 2011, and his membership of the boards of the English European Studies Association from 2009 to 2011, and of the Religious uh, Cultures Research Center, uh, Portuguese Catholic University from 2012 to 2016. Between 2002 and 2006, he was vice dean of the Portuguese Open University. But all these things, um, uh, we uh, imagine that he was very busy, but uh, it was not an impediment to uh, do some research. His uh, main research fields include American studies, comparative studies, and film studies. His latest book on poetry, um, uh, on poetry and visual arts, arts has just been published by Imprensa Nacional along with his collected poems, Corografando, Melodias, No Rumor das Imagines, and excuse my Portuguese. Excellent. He's also author of several works on the above mentioned fields, among which stand out books like O Nascimento, De Uma Nassau, Nas Origins da Literatura Americana, uh, Historias da Literatura Americana, um, uh, Silvia Plath, Poesia e, uh, e Quotidiano, Num dia Dialogo de Traizoes, and the recently published essays, Andrei Tarkovsky's Imaginary, Word, Silence, and Meaning in the uh, Journal of Literature and Art Studies, Alexandria, the Building of, the, uh, of an Imaginary City, Frontiers and Silent Inner Revolutions in the volume Modernity, Frontiers and Revolutions, Ekphrasis, a Narrative, Trump Lail, and Something More in Propeller, uh, Facticity versus Factitiousness, Tom Gunn's poems uh, on under guns and title photographs in The Edge of One of Many uh, Circles. He's also the author of two novels, the latest being Inveja, Uma Novela Academica, or Envy, an academ academic novel. He has translated several English-speaking authors, such as Herman Melville, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, Mary Renault, Robert Lowell, and Lewis Carroll. Um, now he's going to uh, speak to us um, uh, in this uh, talk about filmic grammar, description, and ekphrasis, a subtle dissemblance. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction, which was written by me. <laughs> I, 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 sorry, I, I've skipped the adjectives. I should have filled a little bit. But uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, I feel honored, I feel humbled. It's a great pleasure to be here among friends, people I know for a while. So it's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and now, my talk. Uh, let us say that my talk has four main moments, a prologue, a brief prologue, first part, second part, and uh, the final conclusion, very brief also. A woman, Laura, and a man 
George, stand in front of each other having coffee at a place we imagine to be a diner or a restaurant. In the background, a somewhat idyllic sight sublimely suggests the context of a romantic encounter. I am referring to a scene of João Botelhos, a Portuguese goodbye, one of the first Portuguese movies to address the topic of the colonial war in Africa. Well, only when the eye of the camera starts to move away from the couple, the viewer is able to realize that the background wasn't one of a paradisiac scene, but a mere picture. Then, a new dimension emerges, closer to proof rocks, sawdust floor, and one night cheap hotel. Yet for a few minutes, the viewer experienced what the French critic uh, Jacomo uh, named la sensation fugitive d'un éclair du réel. With this movement, Boutaille made us aware of the fact that cinema is illusion, a simulacrum. He often mentions in his talks the screen's flatness. The picture at the background helps to bring back this notion when, instead of opening the space into a wide tropical context, into a wide aurea mediocritas, confines it to the small room where the characters stand. Here, in this enclosed space, historical time, the war, emerges as a ghostly presence, since another ghost, Laura's fiancé killed in Africa, keeps on haunting all the characters. Laura still addresses her dead fiancé's parents as mom and dad, while these keep on wearing black, a reminder of their dead son's presence. Besides that ghost, her own and their own ghosts won't allow Laura to move forward with a relationship with George. But this is not my main concern. This is a rather narcissistic moment. It was a talk a while ago, quite a while ago, when my hair was still black with Juan Boutaille, the, 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 the movie director. So as, as I was saying, this is not my main concern. One thing I want to develop here is the role of art. The role art, and in this case photography, plays within filmic grammar and how it helps to create the in-betweenness of a multi-layered relationship with time. In-betweenness is a concept that I take from the Irish philosopher, contemporary philosopher, William Desmond, uh, a concept that he develops after the Plato's concept, concept of metaxu, the space that exists between all the, everything. And from, he develops this concept in art, origins, and otherness. Um, it's a, a relevant concept for me since it allows us to understand the uh, artistic object not as a place in itself only, but in its multi-layered relations with society, with philosophy, with tradition, with every other context that we may imagine. This is a concept that has been key to my latest research, namely the book that was mentioned on poetry and visual arts. Yet, I just point out the concept here, although I may mention it, the in-betweenness, I may mention it during my talk, but I will develop another aspect, and other aspects as uh, have been pointed out in the title of my talk. In his 1951 classic, Peinture et Cinéma, French critic André Bazin puts forward the distinction between the way these arts conceive space, Le Cadre, the filmic frame and the pictorial space. In his view, the latest is centripetal because it closes the picture in its own space, while the former is centrifuge because it leads the beholder to turn his or her eyes away from the center beyond its borders, le hors champ, the space that lingers away from our eyes. Eventually, this unrevealed space haunts the narrative, thus building an atmosphere where several layers of time remain as non-disclosed presences. This topic 
the ambiguous presence of time in filmic narrative, enhanced by ekphrasis, stands at the core of my talk. And now, just a brief uh, digression to point out or to remind that ekphrasis is a term that comes from the Greek, means description. The first example we know, uh, just come to us, is from the, the episode, the so-called episode, The Shield of Achilles, in Homer's Iliad, as we have here in, in the slide, in books 16 and 17, Achilles lends his armor to his friend Patroclus and loses it when Patroclus is killed by Hector. His mother, then his mother, the goddess Thetis, goes to Mount Olympus to ask Hephaestus, god of fire, to forge a new armor for Achilles. Here, and this is already in book 18, he depicts the heavens. Here, in the shield, he depicts the heavens, the sea, and the earth represented by many city and rural scenes, both at peace and at war. Um, there's a, a concept which is connected with uh, ekphrasis, the concept of energeia. That means that after we read the, a description, the description of a picture, of a statue, we may actually see the picture in front of us. This ability to reproduce to create a visual image through uh, the text is a concept, a central, a central concept in ekphrasis. Just a few examples, the, some of the most notorious. John Keats, a go old own a Grecian urn. W.H. Auden's The Shield of Achilles and the sequence of poems by William Carlos Williams, Pictures from Bruegel. These are just for the students, of course, because everybody knows this, but I would just wanted to point out this, the, the, to remind this aspect. So my aim today is to approach it, ekphrasis, at two levels. The text within the text. I mean the presence of painting or photography in filmic narrative. So this is the first part of my talk. And the poetic ekphrastic dialogue with film. The, the relationship, relationship between poetry, and now for this talk I just have chosen American poet, uh, between poetry and film. Without being exhaustive, I must sign on some theoretical instance that framed the way this dialogue helped to confirm cinema as an art form in early 20th century within a modernist context. And this leads us back, leads us back to 1936, when two major events took place. The publication of Walter Benjamin's uh, the essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, where the German philosopher inscribed cinema within a meditation upon modernist aesthetics of artistic representation, and W.H. Auden's conference on poetry and cinema at the North, North London Film Society. Two years later, another essay provides a major contribute for this emerging theoretical meditation when, with Lessing's Lao Kun, an essay on the limits of painting and poetry in mind, and just point out that Lao Kun's in the late 18th century is extremely important because it introduces, introduces, introduces two concepts, the arts of space and the arts of time. This is the main distinction between those two arts, those two forms of expression. Um, these, uh, these concepts are extremely important because they, in a certain way, go against the tradition of the ut pictora poesis coming from Horace, and that uh, remained as dominant during uh, uh, many centuries until uh, the ro uh, Romantics uh, and uh, Lessing's essay, the, the idea that the, these were sister arts. What Lessing shows is that they are not sister arts, they are actually two different forms of expression, hence the idea of arts of space and arts of time. So with this essay in mind, uh, another critic, Robert Arnheim, publishes uh, places the new art form in the theoretical historical context between, uh, of the dialogue between literature and visual arts. So the, the, the title of the essay is A New Lao Kun, Artistic Composites and the Talking Film. Uh, 
Although photography had introduced the interference of the machine in the process of artistic creation, the, thus accelerating it, in addition to having made it possible to, to discover the systematic, even if silent, presence of the detail, and detail is a, a very interest, interesting topic. I won't develop it here, but it's very important, for instance, when we realize how important uh, photography was for Walt Whitman's poetry, even, namely when he says, not an inch, not a particle of an inch is vile. It, it, in a certain sense, it evokes the, the importance of photography in capturing the whole scene, let us say, within the frame. So it, it, although, it, uh, it, uh, in addition to having made it possible to discover the systematic presence of detail, it did not mean an overcoming of the dichotomy between arts of space and arts of time that Lessing have proclaimed. It will be in the infancy of cinema when it rehearses its first steps in the sound, the talkies, Notice the reference uh, in the subtitle of the essay to the talking film, that Arnheim feels the need to ponder on the operative persistence of Lessing's dichotomy within the singular context of filmic grammar. Arnheim first emphasizes what he considers to be the perplexity caused by a new aesthetic object. He says, a feeling that something is not right there. Resulting, and this results from the confluence, the encounter, the disconcerting encounter in his view, and possible conflict between two media, verbal discourse and image. And I quote him, in their attempts to attract the audience, two media are fighting each other instead of capturing it by united effort. The main theoretical hypothesis he tried to research and evaluate lied thus on the plausible confluence of two distinct media in a single soil. After summoning the theatrical tradition, which he considered to be hybrid due to the tension between word and image and the necessary conditions for the combination of artistic media, Arnheim asked the ultimate question whose answer could mean the liberation of cinema from the dramatic tradition. Can image and word be combined in a manner different from that of the theater? And further, another question. Could not the visual action become an integral part of the play? It is in this context that he locates the function of poetry, music, painting, or photography, which brings him back to Lessing. In a fragment of time, modernism, in which the hierarchy of different forms of artistic expression is radically questioned, Arnheim shows an obvious difficulty in unraveling the inevitability of the then emerging aesthetic ruptures. From this comes up this soil between the hybridity and consequent formal instability invading the different, different creative spaces and balkanizing in the past the absolutes that for centuries prevailed in these domains. It is ironic that the last paragraph of this essay, while uttering a correct diagnosis of coheval reality, falls short in its conclusion, and I quote, there is comfort, however, in the fact that hybrid forms are quite unstable. They tend to change from their own reality to purer forms, even though this may mean a return to the past. Beyond our blundering, there are inherent forces that in the long run overcome error and incompleteness and direct human action toward the purity of goodness and truth." End quote. Since cinema's early days, while poetry was revealing an hospitality towards the new form of artistic, artistic expression, the latest kept an egg on with the canonical visual art, painting. After all, Jacques Aumont already had proclaimed, le filmique a voulu absorber aussi le pictural. This is not, however, a topic to be developed at this moment. I'm interested now in the impact that a new aesthetic may have on poetic discourse, particularly when painting interferes with the encounter between these two types of record. A theoretical clarification is necessary. The description of a movie does not just oppose itself to ekphrasis, which can, however, participate in filmic grammar. In this context, ekphrasis can assume distinct presences, 
which I analyze in detail in an essay on Polish director Lech Majewski's 2011 movie, The Mill and the Cross. My starting point was a taxonomy proposed by Laura Mareika Sega in writing and filming the painting, Ekphrasis in Literature and Film, in which this scholar defines four subcategories of film, filmic ekphrasis, attributive, descriptive, interpretive, and dramatic. Eventually, I amplified this taxonomy with a fifth category, the metacritical, metacritical ekphrasis. One of the main innovations of Sega's taxonomy, and hopefully of mine's, lies on the radical revision of the concept of ekphrasis, which widens it to a category of filmic grammar. Without dwelling too much on this topic, I must identify each of these subcategories. According to Sega, attributive ekphrasis implies basically allusions to works of art or exhibitions of art without this implying a detailed description is in Alfonso's Plu, Alfonso Plus 1966 film Goya, where the viewer recognizes several paintings of this Spanish artist that emerge in the filmic texture as tableau vivant. In turn, the descriptive ekphrasis takes place when the images are discussed, described, or object of more extensive reflection is in the scene of Alexander Corda's 1936 movie Rembrandt, which would come to be known as The Night Watch, where its characters, who also have the status of beholders, point to some details of the image while the camera displays them through detailed planes, plans. Interpretive ekphrasis, though close to the previous one, differs from it in degree, since introduces, it introduces a clear dimension of self-reflexivity. Laura Sager identifies this category with a quote from Mar Mario Varga Vargas Llosa, description of La Hermana de Cari la Caridad in El Paraíso in el, La Otra Esquina, where we find an abstract interpretive commentary by the narrator and by a personalized reflection from the perspective, perspective Gauguin. Dramatic ekphrasis enlarges the self-reflexivity of the previous one through the dramatization of pictorial scenes, as in Peter Greenaway's 1985, Zed and Tunas, where the English director brings to life, animates through movement and sound, Vermeer's The Music Lesson. As I mentioned a while ago, my own contribution to this theoretical meditation unfolds from my analysis of Lech Majewski's The Mill and the Cross. This is a movie conceived after Michael Francis Gibson's homonymous essay, which in turn was an analysis of Bruegel's painting, The Way to Calvary. Thus, metacritical ekphrasis unfolds not from a painting, not from the reading of a painting, not from watching a painting, but from a critical analysis of a painting. This is a brief synthesis of the ekphrastic presence in, within filmic text, as well as of the different hermeneutic layers and strategies of pictorial recovery that can emerge from it. Now, when poetry interpolates the filmic grammar, one must be aware of a whole new complexity, opacity even, of the intertextual dialogue. In order to unravel this opacity, we must clearly distinguish, through poetic examples, the soils where description and ekphrasis operate in this domain, and this leads us to the next moment of my talk, the dialogue between poetry and moving image. And as I said before, all my examples will be from American poets. And the first one is Harry Brown's poem, Travel Film in Technicolor, which provides a good example of how description may prevail in the textual dialogue with film. In these lines of the American poet and screenwriter, description is the main narrative category in a poetic discourse where the speaker assumes himself as a sort of Cicerone leading the viewer on a journey, as he says, we take you to Pendragonia, introducing each segment, each frame, with a technical insight that also summons a pedagogic tune. 
See in this close-up how tightly he holds the girl to him. Then each stanza coincides with a cinematographically distinct point of view. This panorama reveals beyond the Haycox the Guardian Mountains. This long shot shows an antique temple. This close shot presents a policeman in the busy metropolis. In fact, it is only in these last examples that ekphrasis emerges. That is, the description of the visual sign can coincide with a plane, with a frame, or with a tableau. This is, however, a brief fleeting presence marked by a syncretism which is evocative of the epigrammatic tradition, a subgenre of classical Greek ekphrasis. Due to its radically syncretic character, a mere identification of the object plane, this ekphrasis evokes epigrammatic poetic strategy, something similar, it can be said, of the intertitles of the silent cinema. Finally, this fictitious space in travel, film, and technicolor is denied when reality comes in between and thus imposes itself. And I'll quote a few lines. The cameraman's hands are tired. His feeling for angles strained. His provisionary visa quite expired. The producer's budget exhausted. The lens is blurred. End quote. It is therefore a descriptive process that ends up predominating in this poem. Now, Robert Creeley's Bresson's movie, movies starts where the former poem ends, with an ekphrasis of a plan of a French director Robert Bresson's Four Nights of a Dreamer, paraphrasing it if it was a painting. Then the poet's eyes move into another Bresson's movie, Lancelot of the Lake, and culminates with Wilde's axiom, life imitates art. This ekphrastic succession eventually unfolds a narrative sequence which evokes the traveling in filmic grammar. The epigrammatic trend of ekphrastic tradition also echoes in Robert Conquest's film revival, The Tales of Hoffman. I mention this poem because of the uniqueness of the enunciation strategy, strategy that it ex exhibits. An elliptical record montage of fragments that the poet considered to be relevant for encapsulating the single atmosphere of Michael Powell's and Emmerich Pressburger's 1951 movie, The Tales of Hoffman, about Jacques Offenbach's opera. The prosodic rhythm indebted to a film filmic editing aesthetics are clear in the following lines. Occasionally obsession comes to its flower, grip and shine from the soundtrack and the screen. Light sheer to the glazed dark limbs and the smooth pool. Integrities of the automatic voice, florid, impenetrable Venice. In superfluity of magic a single note shatters the glass jewels. A dancer's arm makes a gesture that is love and art, end quote. Another example of cohabitation between description and ekphrasis can be witnessed in Gerald Burns' double sonnet for Mickey, a text about Robert Aldrich's Kiss Me Deadly, a hypertext of Michael Spillane's homonymous novel. The text evolves from a tune of initial poetic prose where the description coexists with an analytic reading, perhaps critical. He says, he quotes, the plot may be said to turn on a book of Christina Rossetti's poems, but to me, it is that pause, a careless sneer on Mika's face, as he not only does not answer, but sees no reason to get mad. So, through a kind of textual dissolution, gives away to a formally poetic tune, free verse, more precisely. The ekphrasis emerges in this hybrid soiled in between due to the initiation of cinematic lexicon. Two dollar framed people, snapshot castings, where other artistic lexicons are like sculpture, A, Rodin, or classic sculpture, culture, the Sphinx, Echo, amplifying the in-betweenness to another category, time. 
Another circumstance of an encounter between two media occurs when the film is debtor of pictorial register, as in Walter Hill's Hard Times. In this case, in which the director is inspired by Edward Hopper's paintings, one of the poetic solutions for representation lies on the elliptical and almost epigrammatic enunciation of the temporal suspension associated with them, as with Hopper's, from Lessing's perspective. An example of this strategy is the syncopated rhythm, as I mentioned before, elliptical, denying punctuation and supported by special voids of William David Sherman's poem, Homage to Walter Hill's Hard Times. Lonely man in lonely rooms, city man on the cutting edge of the fringe downtown, shades on the dark horizon, romantics in Buddha's palm of no vision. This poem highlights the fact that the presence of the text on the page, its stained interruptions, ellipses, gaps, cannot be eluded in the reading process. It is moreover required that the reader be aware of these dimensions, for it is incumbent upon him to proceed to the inner editing, which the reading process turns out to be. The, ed the reading process turns out to be. Before approaching another aspect of the dialogue between word and moving image, raised by cinema, I must recall a poem that reveals some points of contact which the with the text I had just mentioned. The fourth part of Adrian Rich's Waking in the Dark about Lenny Riefenstahl's celebrated and polemic, polemic mu movie Olympia. Thus reads the poem. Clarity, spray blinding and purging, spears of sun striking the water, the body is riding the air like gliders. The body is in slow motion falling into the pool at the Berlin Olympics control. Loss of control. The body is rising, arching back to the power, time reeling backward. The body is falling again freely, faster than light. The water opening like air, like realization. A woman made this film against the law of gravity. Like in William David Sherman's, the poem suggests in its spatial organization the evidence of filmic images. Yet something singular is evident here. I mean the prosodic suspension, the fragment exposed through the ellipses that mirrors at the textual level the movement of bodies in the filmic space, in the cadre tableau. Since reading is not neutral, the suspension of bodies in space may not be confined to an aesthetic ground, assuming, on the other hand, a nominous dimension. One of the unique features of this encounter between the word and the moving image is the importance of the technical dimension, namely the camera, in the process of creating the aesthetic object. From Baudelaire to Benjamin and Harnheim, it is the pertinence of a full theoretical elaboration initially aroused by photography which stands at their core. Besides the technical dimension, also has an impact in filmic grammar. This is exactly what prevails in Joseph Strauss' documentary. The subject, poet, emerges here as simulacrum, as persona of a movie director, supervising all the movements of the camera and the different technical strategies required to get an aesthetic effect. Bring the camera closer in focus. On the burning gat, zero, it, zero in on the head. I want, you, I want you to catch the skull when it bursts, pen down the torso. The dolly back from the, for the scenic shot, filter the lens. Now zoom down, then back to the panorama, the vista. A distinct formal trait of this text, of this subgenre, remains in the prevalence remains the prevalence of description which through the poetic subject's eye reproduces what he or she considers to be relevant in the film, filmic sequence. If we recall Rudolf Arnheim's objections, objections, especially those relating to the filmic text hybridity, we come to the conclusion that it is precisely here and particularly in its pointers that po poetry identifies the aesthetic virtualities of filmic narrative. In this case, the aesthetic and expressive virtues resulting from music, the soundtrack. 
I quote again, once again Harnheim, though against himself. Music transmits ideas more purely and forcefully, but its interpretation is also more abstract, end quote. This actually is the power of music in action. I believe it is, after all, an amplifying impulse of enunciation for the poetic text, which, since it is not obliged to systematize the critical discourse, can confine its perception to a single topic, or even to a strand of that topic. And voice, its melody, may be one of those strands. I'll just mention two poems, Final Farewell and St. Ignis Eve, where voice becomes the primal, primal object of enunciation. In Final Farewell, the American poet Tom Clark celebrates a climatic segment of filmic narrative, not through a description of a scene, but through the words of a character that he mentions by his own name. Great moment in Blade Runner, where Roy Beatty is expiring and talks about everything his scene will die with him. Ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. Sea beams glittering before the Tannhäuser gates. It is still the voice, this time as simulacrums substitute description through vernacular language, which emerges in Kenneth Fearing's St. Ignis Eve. In his essay, Jewish Gangsters of Modern Literature, Rachel Lurvin starts by identifying the poem's object, a Jewish gangster called Louis Glatz. Then he points out the convergence that was achieved, she points out the convergence that was achieved between sound, the voice, and narrative. Vernacular language and violence merge on the page as they do on stage in Bullets over Broadway. Then follow the lines, and I'll quote, but danger, handsome, cross-eyed Louis the Rat spoke with his cat, rat, rat, tat, 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 rat, tat, 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 and Dolan was buried as quickly as possible. This poem thus poses an interesting question. Can we still consider to be an ekphrasis the strategy of representation in which instead of the visual reproduction, we are confronted with an emphasis on the phonic dimension in its simulation, where eventually energeia lies? From this question, another arises. Does the cohabitation of the media in the cinema allow a revision and the consequent amplification of ekphrasis as we have been used to identify it over time? I also must point out another modality of incorporation of music in the film ekphrasis, Adrian Henry's Stake Out on High Street, a poem about Samuel Fuller's film Pick Up on South Street, film from 1953 which reveals an image of Cold War mediated by the iconographic lens of pop culture. Thus reads the poem, his heart, cruel lips, meet her full red ones, the blonde sneering hoodlum, the brunette in the low neck dress, street lamps over the railway bridge, tasting her lipstick all the way home. Yet filmic, filmic ekphrase is somehow interrupted when some verses in italics break out in the text and thus create an escape effect. Now, these lines belong to a song that was a hit in the 1940s, Dorcas Cochran's and Lionel Newman's Again, which was sung by Hida Lupino in Gian Nogulescu's Roadhouse movie, 1948. In this way, ekphrasis is unceasingly amplified by the convening of another media while the dialogue with the film requires a presence of memory, the memory of the history of cinema and of the very encounters that in this scope film enhance we among them. Besides, this poetic strategy somehow commands the poet to assume a critic's profile, or at least as a holder of specific knowledge within this field. Even in this context, when, albeit subliminally, it evokes the pictorial tradition, the encounter between the word and the moving image can disturb the concept of ekphrasis. We may identify an example of this disturbance in what could be considered an indirect description through the subtleties of the designation of a pictorial genre, still life, in Robert Lowell's Harpo Marx where the poet plays with the Spanish and also Portuguese designation of this genre, dead nature, uh, and in Spanish also bodegones. 
Harpo, your motion picture is still life unchanging, not nature dead. Lowell unfolds here an ironic pun between the movement inherent to film and the suspension typical of the silence of the endogenous actor and the famous mask that his face is. If either through a syncretic strategy or by, a sequen by sequencing film frames, either by the interference of the editing process, the ellipse, or by other elements of filmic grammar, the dissolve, either by bringing, bringing to the limit the aesthetic miscegenation through the reconfiguration of a genre, like Tony Harrison's film poem, an exception of an English poet here, or through the sound simulation of voice or sound, either through a visual reproduction marked by other aesthetic solos, painting, or soils, I'm sorry, like painting or sculpture, or by displaying the face as a mask, it is a whole disturbance and consequent amplification of the concept of ekphrasis that takes place in this encounter between the word and the moving image. And this amplification stems from the ability that so much dysphoria had caused to Arnheim when he revisited Lessing's theoretical legacy in order to better understand the novelty of the object that then emerged. In one of the poles that cinema seemed to choose to conceive of its identity resided this art of space that is painting. Perhaps that is why Thomas Elsazer was right when he rhetorically questioned what better place than a museum to confront the cinema once more with itself and its history? Thank you.